At a unit in Wollongong, south of Sydney, a man is preparing to dispose of a teenage girl's body. The body has been decapitated and the fingers removed. He wraps the girl's head in his dressing gown and puts it and the fingers into a plastic garbage bag. In another bag, he methodically collects a small evening purse, some clothes and jewellery. He then rolls the naked, headless body in two of his bed sheets, carries it to his car and heaves it into the boot. He drives off to dump the body and the bags in local bushland. When the body is discovered the next day, police appear to have very few clues with which to solve a baffling crime. Do you mind this for me? I'll be back soon, all right? Yeah, sure, mate. <laughs> but slowly, a trail of evidence will emerge as detectives embark on one of Australia's most sensational murder cases, involving a brilliant, groundbreaking forensic investigation. In 1981, 19-year-old Kim Barry is a normal Australian teenager who loves to dance and dreams of being a nurse. With her parents Brian and Beverly, her grandfather and her younger brother Wayne, Kim lives a happy family life in Mount Pleasant, a northern Wollongong suburb. Kim was a lovely girl. Um, for those who knew her, as, as I did, she was a very trustworthy person to the point where I allowed her to babysit my two children on occasions. To me, she was always happy and bright, very outgoing, but then very outgoing on the outside, but very sensitive on the inside. But she's just a general run-of-the-mill teenager. To keep her nursing dream alive, she regularly volunteers to help nurse disabled children at Cram House, a local hostel. And Kim was one of the girls that really had a heart for those kids, and she really was interested in uh, taking care of them, helping with, with them, you know, to uh, feed them and clean them, because they, they need cleaning permanently, of course. They were, they were that handicapped. And um, I, I loved working with her, because she was a really good worker. I really thought she was very nice. On Friday the 6th of February 1981, Kim Barry's parents, Brian and Beverly, are out of town for the night. Taking the chance for some freedom, Kim wags her duties, watching over 15-year-old brother Wayne, and instead goes to the movies with her friend Donna Holland. Afterwards, the girls visit a popular local disco, the Crown Garden. Also in the disco this night is 23-year-old miner Graham Potter, who's celebrating his Bucks night. Slow down there, right? He and fiance Cherie Jones are due to be married in eight days' time on Valentine's Day. All right! It's a joint celebration, as it's also a 21st birthday party for Graham's younger brother, Glenn. The disco craze is still raging in 1981, and the Potter boys are keen dancers having studied at a local modern dance studio. Kim also studied dancing at the same school and even had a brief crush on Graham. I think I'm just gonna go home soon. I feel really sick. The last train's coming soon. Come on, stay. I don't wanna be left here by myself. Look, you can stay at my house. My After buying Kim a bottle of wine, Donna decides to go home. She's not feeling well and has to get up early for work. Please, I'd do it for you. Kim begs her friend to stay, saying she can sleep over at the Barry house. She says her parents are away and she's afraid of prowlers. But Donna sees this as a silly excuse to get her to stay. She checks Kim's purse 
and make sure she has enough money for the taxi, then says goodbye. Bye. Why in the morning anyway? Okay. It's the last time she will see her friend. Thanks, mate. Graham, how are you going? Oh, Kim! <laughs> it's not long before Kim spots Graham at the bar and walks over to say hello. Hey, let's go around the corner and have a seat. Yeah, sure. Let's have a chat. Are you having a good night? Yeah, I'm having a great night. Oh, that's well, good. I really like your hair, by the way. It's really nice that. Hey. Sometime later, Graham walks over to Glenn's table and hands him the bottle of wine and his cardigan, saying he'll be back soon. Bro, do you mind this for me? I'll be back soon, right? Yeah, sure, mate. How about this place? Yeah, it was really good. Graham and Kim then take a taxi to Graham's unit in nearby Coral. Really pumping, really full of energy. Look at this. Music. Alright. <laughs> About an hour later, Graham arrives back at the disco alone. How'd you go? No, mate. Got it to the inner door. She got cold feet and left. <laughs> so I left too. Oh, wow. I need a drink, man. This free? No, I'll take that, take that. Excellent, thank you. Mate, you've got nothing to worry about. You've already you got a wife. Oh, mate. come on, man. Shh. The next day, Saturday, Kim Barry's parents arrive home to find that she's left her 15-year-old brother Wayne at home alone and has been out all night. The Jamboree Mountain Lookout, southwest of Wollongong, has breathtaking views out over the southern coastal plain. It's also the favoured place for local car thieves to dump their vehicles once they finish their joyrides. On Sunday afternoon, apprentice plumber Scott Davies arrives at the Jamboree lookout. He needs to repair his old Holden and wonders if there might be any spare parts to be found among the wrecks in the bush below. There's no safety fence at the lookout, so to get a closer look at the wrecks below, Scott crawls carefully down a track just below the edge and looks over the sheer drop. Amid the rusty wrecks in the undergrowth, he suddenly spots what appears to be a naked body wedged against a tree. The head is out of sight. Shit. Horrified, he scrambles back to the top to get help. The body is in a crouching position with rope tying the heels to the wrists. A bra and bone-coloured blouse have been used to bind the arms together. The head is not obscured by the tree, as first thought. It's been cut off entirely at the base of the neck. And the fingers look like they've been chopped off at the knuckles. It was a very barbaric murder. Uh, fingers severed. Um, head decapitated and no sign of either anywhere near the body. They've just been flung over a cliff at, uh, tied, tied with rope and just thrown over the cliff. Had it have not lodged where it did, next to the tree, then it would certainly have travelled a lot further and uh, probably never ever been found. Uh, but, or if it had been found, it would have been found in a skeletal, skeletal state. It was recovered and taken back to the morgue and... Uh, I, having worked at homicide for many years and seen some, some pretty gruesome stuff, that's probably one of the most grisly I've ever had to, had to deal with. On Sunday evening, Graham Potter and his fiancée, Cherie Jones, are at her house watching the news when the discovery of the body is reported. Graham leaves abruptly and spends much of that night giving his home unit here at Coromel a thorough cleaning. At the Jamboree Mountain lookout, police begin a massive search of the area. Organised a bit of a search around the area looking for the head and the hands, which was fruit, fruitless. When we examined the body, we found that it had an unusual bra attached to it and a blouse. Um, that was the only clues that we had 
as to who this girl might be. An autopsy finds there is no evidence of sexual assault. She had a broken right arm at post-mortem and a post-mortem that did not show cause of death. Here was the ultimate challenge to police. First of all, to identify the body. There is a possibility that the girl's palm prints might be on file somewhere. There were no computers about. It was handed to me to search those hand prints against all uh, known females wherever possible, uh, drugs, offences particularly if I could, and uh, endeavour to identify them. Without a computer, it was a Herculean task. I did not relish the job at all, but I remember digging out a few hundred palm and through them. Faced with so little to go on, detectives hold a press conference on Monday morning and make the unusual decision to clues. And um, although it was going to be quite gruesome uh, for the public to see, the only way we could see that you could um, have this uh, person identified, this female identified, was to show the clothing uh, that was found and that was a brazier and a, um, and a blouse. And um, we actually had to get uh, permission from the superintendent in charge of the CIB to, to, to do that. And um, it was broadcast on, on um, national television. On Monday night, Beverly gets home from work just in time to see the bra and blouse displayed on the TV news. It turned out that uh... Bebby noticed a motif on the top of the bra which was exactly the same as Kim's. And this upset her very much because she knew it was Kim's in her own mind. When we come home, she was very upset. And I said, sweetheart, don't be silly, it's not Kim. But anyway, we'll go into the police and check it all out and make sure so she understands the situation. Terry Dawson, who was my workmate, was with the Barrys in the viewing room. And he thinking how terrible it was for this poor Brian Barry to have to stare at this headless, fingerless body. Uh, then we went and identified her by the birthmark, the heart-shaped birthmark she had just with our breast. So yes, it was Kim. And Bevy was very upset, as I was at the time. And poor old Pop sitting on the front steps, you know, and I'm saying, I remember grabbing him and saying, Pop, is it Kim, is it Kim? And he couldn't answer me. And then I went inside and, without knocking, of course, and Bev and Brian, I just hugged them, we couldn't talk. Sorry. And uh, I didn't have to ask them, was it Kim? On Monday morning, Graham Potter withdraws nearly $3,000 in small bills from his bank, and then he makes out a will leaving everything to Cherie. He also gives his solicitor a letter for her, telling the lawyer that he's in trouble and must go away. He then rings Glenn to say he's leaving town. The next day, Cherie receives the letter from Graham, telling her simply that he's gone away, declaring his undying love, and promising her that in time, he'll explain his reasons. A few weeks pass and public interest is beginning to wane, when suddenly another shocking discovery thrusts the case back into the headlines. The body of Wollongong teenager Kim Barry, with her head and fingers removed, Shit. has been found in bushland. There is growing speculation that the gruesome killing and mutilation is the work of hardened criminals, possibly drug dealers. Why did the police immediately assume it was drug related? 
Mainly the post-mortem showed no evidence of sexual assault and they likened it to a recent case called the Mr. Asia inquiry where the uh, drug lords disposed of their uh, unwanted uh, couriers by removing their heads and fingers or hands even. And I had to stop. Who we were we looking for? We were looking for a, um, some person with, it was suggested at different times that it was a, a person with surgical background. It was a satanic ritual uh, or, or similar things when the body was found. But these people, the public in Wollongong, were, were frightened. And we had to work very, very hard to allay their fears and to bring a person into custody. Police investigate every aspect of Kim's life and they're quickly convinced she was a clean living, kind, caring, and responsible young woman. Uh, we knew there was no drugs because there was things that come up through school and that sort of situation, and the way she didn't be want to become involved with girls involved in that scene uh, throughout her school life, and particularly in the high school. There was no, no suggestion whatsoever that uh, Kim was involved in any way in anything other than a, uh, a lawful occupation and a, uh, a good family girl. It's clear that Kim was certainly not the type to be involved with criminals, let alone do anything to give them any reason to kill her. All they can say for certain is that she must have met her killer or killers either inside the Crown Gardens disco or soon after leaving. We then had a copy of the clothing that she wore on that night made up exactly the same and on the Friday night following her death we uh, displayed this together with a photo of uh, Kim outside the disco and uh, as a result a number of people came forward and told us that they'd seen her at the disco that night. Hi, can I just have a bottle of Lee for our wine? Sure, how many glasses? One of the bar attendants remembers selling Kim a bottle of Lee for our wine. Meanwhile, Graham's sudden disappearance causes one friend who'd partied with the Potters at the disco to wonder if there's a connection with Kim's murder. He reports his suspicions to police. Information was received to the inquiry that, that Potter had gone missing from the area. And, um... That was just put on what we call a running shoot at that time. And um, my workmate and I, Gary Roberts, were given the, uh, the job of trying to track down where this Graham Potter might be. Cheers, guys. Oh, thanks, mate. Cheers, Thank boys. you. Checks on Potter's background show that, as well as working in the mines, he had also worked as an assistant at a hospital morgue, where he would have observed post-mortem examinations. I know, I know, I haven't seen you. The major breakthrough comes when they establish that not only was Potter at the disco, but there is absolute proof he was actually with Kim. Do you really want to stay around here? I was thinking of leaving. Change the scene? Yeah. When my workmate and I went and interviewed one of the witnesses, she indicated to us that she was sitting there and a person she knew, being Graham Potter, walked over and put a bottle of Lufra wine on the table as if to say, well, you finish this. We knew from previous information that Kim Barry had purchased the only bottle of leaf from wine that night. So that put Potter with Kim Barry. And then the information that he'd left the area and started us on, started us on his trail. Police immediately interview Potter's family and obtain a warrant to search his Coromel unit. They're surprised to find it's been thoroughly cleaned and is completely empty. It was strange because um, Cherie Jones and, and the Potter family decided to put the, the unit on the market after Potter disappeared. And all of the things that were, that were in the unit when this crime took place had been removed and taken to the parents' house. Police issue a bulletin to watch out for Cherie's 1970 White Holden sedan. Newspapers publish photos of Potter, but all police will say is that he's a person of interest and may have information that can help the investigation.
It's now three weeks since Kim Barry's brutal murder. On a warm Saturday morning, a local man is out driving on the Jamboree Mountain Road. He let the dog out of his car and the dog called him back but the dog wouldn't come. He then uh, made a search to find the dog and found the skull, a human skull. Uh, he, of course, contacted the police and uh, we attended there. And the next day, the skull was examined and the teeth were examined and found that they were identical to Kim Barry's teeth and, of course, it was her skull. Once again, police rescue squad officers converge on the area and mount a widespread search. Not long after it commenced, um, one of the boys came up to me, one of the uh, senior constables, and he said he'd found a trail of hair. And basically this trail of hair led from where the skull was right back to an area hidden or in Lantana, in Lantana where there was a plastic bag and uh, it was examined by our forensic people and it was found that there was a, a dressing gown and some sheets bloodstained in the bag together with the tips of Miss Barry's fingers. About the same time the skull, fingers and other evidence is found in the bush, Potter's car is found at Goulburn, 130 kilometres to the west. He, he took his fiancé's car, which we believe was involved in the disposal of the body, um, to uh, outside um, Goulburn Police Station, and then he decamped from there, leaving the car and a bloodstained shirt uh, in the car, which was his shirt, and which was later matched to... The, the blood was later matched to that of Kim Barry. No other blood is found either inside the car or the boot. Sitting on the dash is another love note from Graham to Cherie, telling her that he's left because he believes his life may be in danger. And again, he promises to ring and explain everything. A police search team revisits his unit, this time with forensic biologist Joy Cool, who conducts tests for blood in all rooms of the apparently spotless unit. In the bathroom upstairs, Joy finds evidence of blood in the basin drain and on a tap. In the spare bedroom, two more blood stains are found and then she spots shampoo bubbles near the edge of one wall. She lifted the carpet in the second bedroom and on the underneath part of the carpet there was a significant blood stain. Some hairs are also found in some fresh paint along the skirting boards. They also find Kim's hair in the clothes dryer. All the blood samples give a positive match to Kim's rare blood type. Her blood group fell in a very rare category. Less than 1% of the population had such a blood group, and this is years before DNA. So we had a person, uh, less than one in 100 had such a blood group. Meanwhile, another search team descends on the Potter family home to examine Graham's stored possessions. They find some bottles of a few paint pots and a hacksaw. Inside a wardrobe moved from Graham's unit, they find signs of blood. And I found um, similar um, sheeting, uh, flannelette sheeting. Um, and I also found a dressing gown cord which matched the, uh, the blue coloured dressing gown that was found. Later that day, I took Mrs Potter to the scientific section at Wollongong and she identified the items as belonging to her son. The government medical officer, Dr Vincent Verzosa, finds the fingertips correspond exactly to the hands on Kim's body. The skull has a large area of missing bone on the left temple. The indent in the bone and the way it's placed indicates it was made by a large heavy object. Dr. Vizosa takes a spanner found among Graham's possessions and pairs it to the indent in the skull. Uh, it was subjected to a number of tests, uh, but um, it was negative for blood. But it, it, suited, the, it suited the wounds uh, that were on the skull when it was found. 
Even though there's no proof it's the murder weapon, the other circumstantial evidence against Potter is now overwhelming. When the fugitive finally reappears, he surprises everyone by vehemently protesting his innocence. And he has a dramatic explanation for how Kim Barry was killed. A brilliant forensic investigation into the murder and mutilation of teenager Kim Barry has identified the likely killer. Blood traces matching Kim's rare blood type are found in the home unit and on the clothes of 23-year-old miner Graham Potter. A national manhunt is underway. Uh, all other people were eliminated as suspects at that stage through our investigations. And uh, it was a matter of finding Graham Jean Potter and being able to question him. Various sightings of Potter are reported from around Australia, but none can be verified. Um, we always felt that he would return home because he was close to his family. But um, it, was, so it was a waiting game. In early April, a motorist driving to Wollongong tells collectors at the old toll booths on the F6 expressway that he's seen Potter trying to hitch a lift. A few nights later, Potter sneaks into his parents' home and after a tear-filled reunion, he tells them what happened to Kim Barry. His story begins on the evening of his Bucks party when Glenn left his car at Graham's Coromel home unit and the two brothers took a cab into town. Yes. Hey. Thanks, mate. Graham, how are you going? Kim! Where? How are you? Around midnight at the Crown Gardens disco, he meets a girl he knows only as Kim, and they sit and talk on the lounge. You look upset. What's the matter? These two men were harassing me. They kept walking up and threatening me. Why would they want to do something like that? I don't know, but I want to leave. He says she tells him she's frightened and trying to hide from two men who want to harm her. They might even be waiting for her outside. Not wanting to ignore a girl in distress, Graham says he agrees to escort her to the taxi rank. He leaves her half-finished bottle of wine and his cardigan with Glenn and his friends and goes outside with her to the taxi rank. Once outside the disco, Kim tells him she's afraid to go home. Back to yours. Mum and Dad aren't home. I don't, I'm too scared to go home. Please, I'll tell you everything. Please. All right. I'm not far. I'm just. Okay. Thank you. You'll be all right. It's about 1 a.m. when they catch a taxi to his unit. Come in. This is my place. Have a seat. I'll make a cup of coffee and you can tell me everything about it. All, all right. right. Thank you. All right. There's a knock at the door. Who's that? And Graham assumes it's a friend who's missed the Bucks party. Hello? Hey! Hey! hey. Oh, come on, mate! This is my Two strange men push their way in. Do you know these people? It's all right. Just let me talk to them. They want to talk to Kim in private. Piss off upstairs. Are you sure? It's OK. It's OK. Kim assures him she'll be all right. So Graham reluctantly goes upstairs and waits. Did you think he'd get away with it? Suddenly he hears shouting and loud noises. He says he goes back down to find Kim lying on the floor with one man kneeling over her. The other man is searching through her purse. He sees blood and realises Kim had been killed. He's told if he doesn't keep his mouth shut and cooperate, he'll also be killed, along with his family. Don't worry about her, we'll take care of it. 
He begs them not to hurt him, promising he won't say anything. He says he's ordered to return to the disco and act as if nothing has happened. They warn him that if he tells anyone, then he will be blamed for the murder as it happened in his unit. It's about 2 a.m. when he gets back to the disco. How'd you go? He says he follows the murderer's instructions, continuing to party with Glenn and their friends as if nothing has happened. Come on, mate, we gotta get you home. At 4 a.m., he and his brother take a taxi back to the unit. Graham says nothing to his brother about the murder. It's all right, come on, mate, next step, next step. Come on. Oh, jeez, On entering the living room, he's relieved to see a blanket has been thrown over the area of the living room floor where he last saw Kim's body. I go on the couch, right? Glenn goes to sleep on the couch while Graham heads upstairs to bed and cries himself to sleep. The next day, Glenn leaves at 7 a.m. and soon afterwards, there is another knock at the door. The murderers push their way in and force Graham upstairs, where they reveal Kim's body has been left in the spare bedroom. A horrified Graham is forced to stand by while the men decapitate the body on the floor of the upstairs bathroom using a knife and meat saw taken from the kitchen. Done it. You've got to get rid of the body. You got it? What? Oi, look at her. They then instruct him to dispose of the body, warning him that if he doesn't continue to cooperate, he will be blamed for the murder. Graham says he's now in too deep to turn back. As soon as the murderers leave, he hitchhikes into Wollongong where he borrows Cherie's car and, at about 8.30 in the morning, returns to the unit. He ties the hands and feet using Kim's own bra and blouse and then wraps the body in his sheets and carries it to the car. After wrapping the head in his dressing gown, he picks up the fingers and puts them into a plastic garbage bag. It's then placed in the car behind the driver's seat. Kim's purse, her rings, and the rest of her clothes are then placed in a third bag, along with a blood-stained rolling pin that he assumes was the murder weapon. Graham drives up to Jamboree Mountain Lookout, where he dumps the body. Turning back down the mountain road, frightened and confused, he suddenly remembers the bag with Kim's belongings in the boot and stops to throw it into the bush. Further on, he was to realise the bag with the body parts was still behind his seat and he pulled over again to throw it away. After staying with Cherie on Saturday afternoon and all day Sunday, Potter spends Sunday night cleaning his unit to remove all traces of the murder. On Tuesday, he drives to Goulburn, abandons Cherie's car and takes a train to Melbourne where he changes his appearance. He dyed his hair 
He'd uh, dyed his um, chest hair uh, to a reddish colour, so he'd obviously wanted to disguise himself while he was on the run, because uh, his photo was national wide um, as being wanted for Kim Barry's murder. Graham says that he flew to New Zealand, where he found a job. It's not until he hears he's under investigation that he decides to return to Wollongong and assist police with their inquiries. When Potter arrives home, his family calls the police and he's promptly charged with the murder. He refuses to answer any police questions, to make any statement, or to give any blood or hair samples. In fact, it's not until his trial that the police and public first hear his sensational explanation of what happened. Wollongong miner Graham Jean Potter has been charged with the murder of teenager Kim Barry. At this stage, he will only tell his lawyers the whole story and even adds some new information. Part of that statement also said, I remember on the way home, uh, I, I said to Kim, will you pay for the taxi? And she showed me a purse that had no money in it. But I did notice all these little white packets, plastic bags full of white powder. But I didn't think anything of it at the time. Another logic tells you that if you've got a hundred thousand dollars worth of heroin in your bag, which was disproved later, <laughs> that you wouldn't be showing it to some idiot and saying you haven't got a penny. On July 22nd, 1981, Graham Potter appeared at a magistrate's committal hearing. Among the spectators were Kim's parents, Brian and Beverly Barry. The hearing lasted several days, and Brian attended every day, but refused to allow his wife to be present when evidence of Kim's mutilation was presented. The prosecution called more than 50 witnesses to outline all the evidence, pointing to Potter as the killer. It wasn't until the defence applied again for Potter to be released on bail that his story of Kim being murdered by two men is publicly aired for the first time. The revelation caused uproar in the courtroom. Potter's story is loaded with inconsistencies. He hardly knew Kim, and yet he claims he left his Bucks party and his brother's 21st to help her. He later took his brother back to a crime scene, knowing a body and two killers might still be there. And then he went to bed without even looking in the spare room. He returned to the, the disco. He went past, it went a short distance from Wollongong Police Station. So if he, his story has later, later come out that two other people had killed her, Kim Barry, and had left and told him to get rid of the body. He, he was by himself. Why would he have gone to the police station? If you had got attacked by drug men and told to get away down to the dance hall and you came back three hours later, wouldn't you search the house for these terrifying thugs? But he doesn't even look into the spare bedroom. He, as he alleged these two men had killed the girl. Let's go. And they're going to come back to the uh, to the scene of the crime after they let a person go and let him do whatever he liked to do. Police could have been wait, could be there examining the body. You've got to get rid of the body. You going to do that? All right, do it. All right. And of course, he went to the extraordinary length of dumping the body in one location, and then of course the head and fingers in another location. While Potter's on the run. All the stories he's been reading, up until he ran and afterwards, always seem to carry the same theme. People who chop heads off, people who remove hands, are in the drug trade. Oh, no! Potter's lawyers again seek to have him released on bail. The request is again denied, but the court orders that his story of the two men be investigated. A police identikit expert is sent to Sydney's Long Bay Jail, 
where Graham spends an amazing four and a half hours over two days choosing the facial features to make up portraits of the men. The identikit experts say witnesses usually choose the eyes first, but Graham keeps changing the eyes. And uh, we had to then go around and see all the witnesses we knew from the disco and find out whether anyone had seen those particular men. Nobody had seen those men. The trial opens in the Wollongong Supreme Court in March 1982. Joy Cool presents all her evidence of the bloodstains found in Graham's unit matching Kim's rare blood type. Even more sensational are the tests on a hacksaw found among Graham's possessions. A number of scientific tests were done by uh, Detective Sergeant Henry Delaforce, an incredible scientific fellow, and probably one of the best in New South Wales at that time, if not the best. Sergeant Delaforce had to uh, give illustrations of the markings left on bones using different uh, saw blades. Delaforce also showed that pliers had most likely been used to remove the fingers from Kim's left hand. After 11 days of evidence, the Crown rests its case. Graham Potter is the only witness for the defence, but even now he avoids any questions. Instead, he makes what's called a dock statement, thereby avoiding cross-examination. He would have given himself in such a tangle that it would have been obvious to anyone that he was guilty. His, his legal advice would have given him, don't possibly get in the witness box because you're going to be ripped apart. In his summing up, Graham's barrister points out that police have shown no motive for the killing. He also suggests that the two methods of removing the fingers is proof that two murderers were involved. The defence position is that Graham cooperated with the killers and ran away because he was genuinely in fear of his life. Crown Prosecutor Mr Joseph Gibson QC then summed up, calling Graham Potter a cold, cunning and calculating killer. And just over an hour later declares Graham guilty of murder. I remember Justice O'Brien making comment about that, uh, what tremendous um, scientific work had been done, more particularly by Sergeant Delaforce and all members of the, of the investigative team. It was, it was a, a really uh, a jigsaw puzzle that came together because of scientific work. It was a forensic evidence that, uh, that carried through on the day because there was never any admissions. Witnesses, there wasn't any to my knowledge. Um, and it was a very difficult case that had to be proved on uh, forensic evidence. Are you satisfied that justice has been done? Yes, the judicial system has worked in accordance with the evidence prescribed. A few months later, he marries Cherie in a brief ceremony inside Goulburn Jail. He continues to protest his innocence, and his new wife and the rest of the Potter family vow to continue the fight for his freedom. When all appeals fail, they try to get the case reheard by the High Court of Australia, but the request is rejected. In April 1982, Wollongong miner Graham Potter is convicted of the murder of 19-year-old Kim Barry. Come in. A lasting question hanging over the investigation is why. The motive, suggested by police and prosecutors, is that Potter took Kim home intending to have sex with her. One coming up. His, his idea of romance in this situation is he's probably had several drinks since his bucks night. He's going to play games until dawn with this lass. Thank you. Cheers. It's all about you and me tonight. What have you got there? But somewhere... Are you getting married next week? 
Kim Barry decides that it's getting out of hand. I'm not married now. Or Kim Barry has noticed a photograph, perhaps, of the killer with his girlfriend, his fiancée. There could have been many indications that we are not aware of. But logic tells me she has found out about this romance and I want to go back to the disco. No, no. You come all this way. You don't have to be getting disappointed. Stop worrying about it. Stop worrying about it. Hey, stop. Stop worrying about it. All right? Stop it. Let go! Detectives have even suggested that Kim may not have been killed with the first blow. I believe she was unconscious. Um, that is supported by the fact that um, Kim and her girlfriend had purchased some food between when they'd been at the cinema and when they attended the disco. When, Kim Barry's, when the body of Kim Barry was subject to post-mortem, um, there were no stomach contents which indicated that there was a complete digestion of the food over a period of time. The post-mortem indicates that she might have been left dying in Potter's unit for some hours. Detectives believe Potter must have lost his temper and hit Kim hard enough to cause serious injury. She may have even lost consciousness at this point. It looks like the killer has struck the girl savagely with a right-handed blow and then losing all libido or other intents he had in mind, has uh, decamped from the scene and immediately got a taxi back to the disco, which is a 15-minute drive, to establish an alibi when she might die because he thought, or I believe he thought she was going to die. Cheers. Sorry. Come on, man. Come on. When the party winds down at the disco, the Potter brothers head back to Graham's unit. All right, have a good sleep. Brother's gone to sleep downstairs, and the killer has gone to uh, gone upstairs to allegedly go to bed. He goes in and checks the spare room, but to his amazement, Kim Barry is still alive. It's believed Potter then panicked took a heavy object, a spanner or a rolling pin, and brought it down on the girl's head. This was proven at post-mortem, two uh, heavy strikes to the head by a right-handed person. But even then, she still is breathing. Blow to the front of the head doesn't always kill that easy. So then I believe, in my own mind, that he's strangled her. And this was supported later by the pink discoloration of the teeth. There was some forensic evidence that when a person is strangled, the tiny capillaries in the teeth themselves will burst and the blood, the moisture of the blood will dry out and leave a pink discoloration at the bottom part of the teeth. In 1987, bushwalker Rod Pettit discovers a garbage bag in dense bush near Jamboree Mountain Road. Inside is Kim's purse, her jewellery and clothes. I opened the bag up and I found the card with Kim Barry's name on it. And it had a couple of dollars in the old green $2 notes in there. Then I found the, the rolling pin and and, and I'm sure there was a pair of shoes and a belt and I think a dress. There was no blood on the rolling pin either, but there's scarcely any doubt as to what part it played in the murder of this young girl. The contents of the purse match Donna's description exactly, right down to the two $2 notes she'd saved for her cab fare home from the disco. This is a little class purse which Kim had. Uh, and as you can see, to get uh, tons of drugs in that, I don't know what he referred to as tons, but I doubt very much whether you get too much in there. In the end, all attempts to win a new inquiry into his case proved fruitless. 
Frustrated and depressed, Potter escapes from a minimum security jail in 1990, accompanied by another prisoner. They're soon recaptured, and Potter is punished with an additional three months on his sentence. In 1996, after 15 years in custody, he's released on parole. Kim's family must learn to live with the grief of losing their beloved daughter. Throughout the ordeal, Brian has attempted to shield his wife from the worst aspects of the case and the gruesome details of the trial. It's not until years later, after Beverly has died, that Brian discovers that she eventually found her own way to cope through forgiveness. Uh, my wife kept forgiving long before I ever did. I didn't know that till after she died. Uh, my son forgave him long before I ever did. I'm the only one that didn't. I didn't give him for 23 years uh, because he hadn't, he still doesn't admit that as far as I know, that he was guilty. Uh, that aside, uh, it's not between me and him anymore, it's between him and God. And uh, the only way I can get on with my life was to, to forgive him. And Graham Jean Potter, I have forgiven you. God be with you. Make your peace with God.